we, um, we're going to spend some time looking at depressive disorders, and so I don't think this is in your notes, and uh, so we're gonna cover that real quickly, and then we'll go and cover um, the topic of therapy today. And so look at your notes and see if you have any questions, and then, um, there we go. And uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll cover some real quick class uh, uh, issues and uh, for the exam, as you know, which is on Wednesday. Um, and then the final, I'll talk a little bit about it as we get started. So here's what I'll do. Let me, um, let me begin by praying for us and then uh, um, and then we'll start from there. Father, we just take a minute right now to um, ask you to, um, to be here with us. We know that uh, in these busy times, especially um, just this last couple of weeks of school, that um, we uh, have the ability of um, being sustained uh, by who you are, by your care, your patience, and forbearance with us, and also your love for us. So we do that, and I, I just pray for um, uh, the next couple of weeks, especially for uh, many students who are dealing with uh, the pressures and stresses of uh, just a busy time. I pray for um, just protection and surrounding of them, and then uh, for the way in which we know that you um, had protected all of us even during our travel, our vacations, and then the upcoming trips that we have. We just thank you for that. Thank you for being a God that um, cares deeply for us, that knows us intimately, and calls us your children. So we just thank you. We invite you here today, and in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we, um, as we go about looking at um, the last chapter in this section, let me remind you, the exam um, on Wednesday covers the three chapters. Uh, I think the study guide has the chapter numbering wrong, but the content is correct. So the chapters, uh, the topics that we'll be covering on Wednesday on the exam um, will be personality, uh, disorders, which we've just finished, and therapy, which we will finish talking about today. Um, and so that'll be on Wednesday. Then the final is only over two chapters, uh, health psychology and social psychology. And that final, if you wanna put it in your notes and make sure is on Wednesday at 1 p.m. in this room, okay? Wednesday at 1 p.m. in this room. Uh, does anybody have a schedule and know that they can confirm that's what you've seen in the schedule? I'm almost certain that's what I saw, okay? Final. Two chapters, social and health, so it's not a comprehensive final, and it is on Wednesday, and you do not need to show up um, on Wednesday, on Monday during finals week, because I won't be lecturing, so Monday there's no class uh, of finals week, and um, there is only class on Wednesday during the final, and if you're not taking it, you don't even need to come, all right? Does that make sense? Now, um, the exams, I'm gonna try and get them posted as soon as possible. You take them Wednesday, because a lot of you will get, hopefully will have, this week we're aiming to get everything that you've done put onto Blackboard so you'll know whether or not you need to take the final or not based upon your results. So my goal is by Friday evening to get not only exam four, but everything else online so you can just take a peek at it and know right away your point total. Um, the latest will be of course Monday, uh, which is a week from today that we have to like to get everything updated. Um, are there any questions about this or anything else related to uh, class? And yes? Yeah, for those that are doing the IQ personality inventories and you've read those articles and chapter, how many are there uh, and are with me on that one? Um, you, uh, right now, the plan is to have you submit them online just like um, you, you will go into Blackboard and do that. They're not due until Wednesday, I believe. Is that right? Maybe Thursday, I forget. Um, but either way, you'll do it right now. Plan on just submitting it by Blackboard. You'll see a link that I'll put up that'll be open, and then you just simply attach your paper that way. So. Is it just the chapter 
Yeah, there's an article, and look on Blackboard what you need, and it's right there on there. Yeah, go ahead, question. Um, say we somehow don't manage to get three experiments in, what, what is the result of Yeah, three experiments. Uh, how many are still missing one experiment? Okay. Probably, how many are still missing two? All right. Um, here's what I'll need you uh, to do. This week, um, we will be putting on the last survey, which uh, almost everybody will be able to participate in. It won't have a, the last surveys there have been just numbers uh, that we, they only needed a certain amount. Um, the one that we'll be putting on, you'll be able to complete it, and uh, most of you will be able to get at least one uh, experiment out of that. If you still need to, um, there are, there's one other possibility, and, and it's not for everyone, but what I've done is, um, uh, what we will do is, we're trying to figure out a way, how many took the, the survey in which you got five dollars that came that way? Okay, we're trying, how many don't even, didn't do that one? Most of you probably didn't see it. There were some who were selected to do that. We're looking to see if we can make that count as well. That might help some people. But I'll let you know that on Wednesday during the exam. I'll put a little note up about whether or not that's accepted. So on Wednesday, here's what will, what will happen. You'll end up, um, by this week, you'll find that last link to a survey. And then hopefully that'll take care of almost all of your survey experiment needs. For some that still need one, there's a way to get one, two, or three experiments done by simply looking in the syllabus, page three, and there's a way of writing a very brief written report that will take you you can write three or two or one of them to get credit for one, two, or three experiments, okay? Look in the syllabus. It's a very brief written report, and um, that way if you're still missing an experiment, you'll have an opportunity to write a quick summary of one instead of participating. And um, like I said, if even if you need three, you can write three little reports to get credit for three experiments. Does that make sense? And that's been in the syllabus, just in case some of the surveys you weren't able to get to or to do some of the experiments. Okay, if you have questions, you can ask, yeah. The IQ test, if you, when you're writing that paper, do you write about the actual testing? Yeah, you just give me a quick summary for the IQ test. You write a summary of the articles that you read, and it's about a page and a half. And you, you could briefly mention some of your experiences in there of taking the IQ test, but that's just what, you, what, what, what it was like and, uh, and your experience doing that. It's not really great. It just tells me that you've gone through it. Yeah. How long was the paper again? Um, I don't remember. It's in the syllabus. I think it says under two pages. For the IQ thing? Yeah. For the written reports, they're about a page long, if you look at that one. All right. Good. Well, yeah, one more. We'll just make it December 1st, which is Wednesday, is that right? Yeah, sorry, just make it Wednesday, yeah. Okay. This is where I ended last time? Is that right? All right. One of the things I'd like to make sure and have you um, think about as you look at your notes are, A, are there any questions on any of the disorders we covered? We covered anxiety disorders and all the specific kinds. What falls under anxiety disorders? You have phobias. What else? Obsessive compulsive disorder. What else falls underneath an anxiety disorder? Generalized anxiety, right? So the main ones we covered. We talked about schizophrenia and the different types and the causes and the prognosis. We looked at depression, things like what we call mood disorders. This was how we ended by looking at some video clips. And in fact, the last clip that we watched on Wednesday was about somebody who was suffering from major depression, major depression who was able to undergo a fairly controversial type of treatment known as what? Electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the treatment using ECT for major depression and some other treatments that are available for people that are suffering from some of these disorders. Why is it controversial? 
The controversy about ECT isn't necessarily because of its use today. The controversy is a little bit more historical in that um, in the past, ECT was initially started. Anybody familiar with the movie um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? It's a fairly old movie with Jack Nicholson. It's an amazing movie. If you want to see something eye-opening, um, the reason it's controversial is because of its history. It was started off by someone who originally believed that um, um, uh, somebody with schizophrenia wouldn't have epilepsy and that they didn't have seizures. And so they thought that these two things were um, uh, incompatible with each other. And so someone got the idea that, well, let's take schizophrenics then and give them seizures, so to speak, to see would that, uh, you know, electrically induced seizures, would that stop their schizophrenia? And so they subjected many people that at the times were in hospitals, um, uh, especially in severe cases, and that's what the movie depicted was using convulsive therapy putting people underneath this very painful electrical stimulation which caused a seizure um, and the movie is about what that was like and then also you, the use of lobotomies which was also at the time uh, a treatment that was thought effective. Well, they were wrong and that was the, the problem. Um, individuals with schizophrenia can have epilepsy or can have seizures uh, but here's what happened. A lot of people that were misdiagnosed and that had depression showing signs of psychotic uh, psychosis, it actually began to help them. And so we'll talk a little bit about the controversy of it in, in that it appeared to in the past be used against patients. Today, it's a very effective treatment for severe depression. So it's not controversial in that regard um, of use today. Well. I'll show you a little bit more about that. But here are the key variables uh, just related to when we explain depression. Sometimes depression is explained by the various pressures that people feel. Um, you don't have to put down the stuff on the right over here. The idea is that there's a variety of different things that affect people and affect their levels of depression, uh, whether it's academic, financial, personal difficulties. Basically, these just simply increase increase a person's risk, the pressures of life. But another big category um, that has been examined now over probably the last 40, 50 years and noticed, and that is where people live. We have more rates of depression in, in this country. Up in the, up here you can see it's affected by the northern latitudes. Um, then it would be in what's called the lower southern latitudes, um, where the rates are significantly lower lower for depression. And so people started asking, is it possible that the lack of sunshine is causing higher amounts of depression in, uh, because of people living up in the north versus a 1 to 2 percent rate, for example, of something called seasonal affective disorder, or sometimes referred to as SAD. Seasonal affective disorder is um, a type of depression that strikes only during the winter season, or it seems to be associated with uh, affecting people during the winter season. And quite possibly then, that's one of the variables, a lack of sunshine. And so they've been exploring that for a number of years now. Um, explaining depression also, we, you have to bring in the genetic link here, um, that you have a, a slightly increased risk um, if you're um, genetically predisposed to depression. And we see this in that there's higher rates for people with especially, of all the mood disorders, bipolar probably has a, a, the strongest genetic link of almost all the disorders. Bipolar disorder has a strong genetic link. And in that case, we know genetics plays a role as well. Um, ultimately, then, the pressures of life possibly some of where we might live, uh, genetically being slightly predisposed to this one, especially the bipolar of all the mood disorders. And then ways in which we think. Um, cognitive learning perspective talks a little bit about how our negative perceptions and our thoughts can influence rates of depression and help explain some accounts uh, of depression. So self-defeating beliefs might lead depressed people to evaluate their own behavior incorrectly or their competency incorrectly.
And so this type of perspective would say one, uh, one way to explain depression is that people begin to think these thoughts in which they're not accurately identifying their competency level or, or what they are like, and this is leading them to not only focus on their mistakes, but to ignore some of their successes. And you'll see this is um, one way that this kind of thinking might contribute to uh, feelings of depression. Another one is focusing on mistakes, uh, but also especially in comparing them or comparing oneself to somebody else. Um, so this compare themselves un unfavorably with others, rejecting compliments from others, all of these kind of lead into different ways in which a cognitive learning perspective is attempted to explain rates of depression. Okay, are there any questions on some of the key variables or some of the explanations? We're gonna wrap up the topic of depression and then I wanna move into how do we go about helping people uh, with some of these disorders that we've been identifying and, and the, uh, the field of, th the psychological area of uh, therapy has a long history of working in this uh, area with, with individuals that are suffering from these disorders. Yeah, they're not, yeah. The question is um, the genetic link with mood disorders. A as you saw before, there is, there is definitely a genetic link. It, um, it's, all mood disorders are not explained by genetics. There are other variables that come into play. But if you um, have both of your parents, for example, are bipolar, you have a much greater risk of suffering from bipolar disorder uh, than the normal population. In fact, if you have an identical twin, it's as high as 80% likelihood, which tells you there's a strong genetic link. Um, but for mood disorders in general, um, they're not sure about the idea of skipping generations. Um, there, it probably doesn't necessarily skip, though there are, this is a fairly complex area, by the way, so it's not, you know, we can find rates and see that you have an increased risk, but it doesn't um, necessarily mean that um, just because someone has bipolar in your family that you are your, uh, you're, that you're going to get it, just the elevated risk is there, and so we know there's a genetic link, but um, they're still trying to find out how big of a link and what are the other variables that contribute to it, so. Yeah, big area of study, and it has been for years now, trying to determine causes. Is negative thinking a cause or an effect? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good uh, question. She says, people who do these kinds of negative thinking, is it because they, these, this negative thinking leads to the depression, or does the depression cause negative thinking? And it, it's, it's a question that is not easily answered. <laughs> It's kind of a combination, and it probably is one of these very difficult things. Let's like dopamine and schizophrenia. If you find schizophrenics, you tend to find increased amount of dopamine in their brains. Does that mean that's, that, the, in, that the dopamine and, and the elevated levels is causing schizophrenia, or is it schizophrenia is causing increased elevation, elevated levels of dopamine? And it gets back to the idea of correlational uh, studies that are just finding these things. Hard to determine. Uh, uh, exactly what's happening. Okay, so when it comes to looking at then treatment, we have a variety of ways and of things I wanna just talk about today um, related to therapy. So we're going to look through different attitudes toward therapy, what are the objectives of all the therapies that are out there, and then we're gonna look specifically at the biomedical therapies and briefly at the psychological therapies. Um, I want you to look in the textbook at all of these, but let me just highlight what we're doing. You remember this individual? Uh, I forget his name now. Maybe some of you will remember it. I don't remember. He was dealing with schizophrenia. This is Jerry, how many remember Jerry twirling his hair like this, who was uh, also paranoid uh, schizophrenic who showed symptoms of almost, that are comp all related to schizophrenia. You remember her who uh, was dealing with what type of disorder? OCD, uh, her obsessions were uh, surrounding her children, uh, especially her child, but also hand washing, if you remember for her, she would wash her hands in that 30 minute period, what was it? 
like 20 times in that 30 minute period uh, the belief that uh, she was, um, it, it, her hands, or she was getting germs, uh, and then if worried for her, you could see how it inf influenced and impacted her life. Then we had someone who was suffering from manic depression, and uh, we saw Mary, and which is where we ended class last week in looking at Mary who showed strong depression and then uh, was in this case helped by electroconvulsive therapy. Um, in this case, psychotherapy is an attempt to help individuals that are suffering from these disorders and it's um, defined as this emotionally charged confiding interaction between a trained professional or a trained therapist, a trained therapist, and then someone who suffers from psychological difficulties. In this case, um, this leads to um, a whole host of types of therapies that are out there, um, because this is just the broadest definition possible of what we call psychotherapy. S in an emotionally charged, confiding interaction between a trained therapist and someone with psychological difficulties, you find lots of room and lots of different approaches to helping treat people. Um, in this case, all of these individuals have received treatment, okay? Now the treatment varies depending upon who they talk with, but this is really, if you want, um, the, the broadest sense of what goes on in a therapy type session. Um, this idea of a confiding interaction is what's very important, and that is um, you can, th there's um, the idea that you can talk with somebody who's around, who's also trained by, with somebody who suffers, and um, there's a variety of different perspectives that have occurred, uh, including our own views uh, and our own attitudes toward therapy. So some general attitudes um, out there that exist can vary um, uh, even within different cultures. Professional or trained therapists are sometimes thought of as people who can help and sometimes treated with maybe uh, less likelihood of believing that they can help. Of those that are suffering the most, those that are mentally ill, um, at least the, the most recent numbers are showing a good 50% of people will even deny that they're ill. So people that are sad, depressed, even those that are dealing with anxiety, schizophrenia, 50% of those that seem to be suffering deny the fact, why would they deny that they are ill? What is it about humans? What is it about people that are suffering from a, let's say one of these disorders, why would they not want to admit that they're sick? Is there something wrong with it? Is there something that leads individuals? Well, this is probably why there are still available options um, that have to be used, and some things like involuntary hospitalizations can occur. Um, the, just to give you some raw numbers that are out there, um, in involuntary hospitalizations, they occur on a daily basis right here in Los Angeles County. Uh, and it is something in the California Welfare Institutions Code that allow for this. It's called a 5150. It's a um, police term for if they go to a, uh, on a call and they suspect that somebody is dealing with mental illness, uh, they can invoke section 5150. In fact, if you ever hear a police officer when they are talking with you, use that number. <laughs> they don't believe that you are mentally all there. Uh, and a 5150 simply allows them to um, get the authorization to hold a person for up to 72 hours and for as you can petition the courts for as long as 14 days to hold somebody. Anybody know of a recent person that you heard this was occurring, involuntary hospitalization? Yeah, Britney Spears uh, was one where she was, uh, they called out, they were concerned about her, um, 
uh, behavior and her actions about her safety, the safety of those around her. And um, the LAPD, by the way, on average, gets about 100 calls a day um, that uh, are related to uh, individuals that they suspect are mentally ill, of which a quarter of them, 20 to 25, are lead to invol involuntary hospitalization. Britney Spears, somebody mentioned, is a perfect example of, um, she was, somebody called, she went out, uh, they went out, and uh, the police decided that for her own interests and for the interest of her children and the family that she was not, um, uh, dealing with everything as she should be, uh, and they put her in involuntary hospitalization. Now, she, I think she was only there probably for 72 hours, um, but at least you can still do that. By the way, um, while we, uh, a lot of these institutions are designed to help, um, you can actually find, for example, they, one guy did a study, he found out that he, they sent uh, individuals to a state hospital to find out could they themselves get themselves committed, uh, and one of the most effective ways of a person walking off the street and getting help was simply admitting that they were hearing voices. If they said that they were hearing voices, they would almost always uh, be admitted for 72 hours, <laughs> which is very interesting because what, what, what was occurring is in some cultures, that notion, that idea is indicative of somebody who's probably dealing with um, uh, maybe a psychotic break or a potential psychotic break, and so those kinds of things would get a person uh, under 72 hours of evaluation. And so when police officers go out and deal with this, this is a very important thing that they can use uh, to help individuals. Now after 72 hours, if the person convinces them that they are not a danger to themselves or a danger to others, they can be released. Um, and let back go. Um, and uh, that is uh, just part of what we use to help. Now, this just goes back to show that a lot of people uh, ultimately that are dealing with mental illness never get any of the help that they need. And so you can see here, of all the schizophrenics, only uh, less than half uh, ever receive treatment. And that's a pretty big number if you think about it, um, that those that are suffering from this, less than half are getting the treatment that they need. Mood disorders, maybe a third of the individuals um, are getting treatment. Um, by the way, when they do seek help, uh, while the majority tend to get untreated, they um, do seek help from a variety of sources, uh, whether it's professionally trained psychologists or psychiatrists, medical doctors, clergy and pastors, uh, oftentimes support groups. These are the locations where they oftentimes try and get help. So who seeks therapy? And um, I'll just put up a list uh, of different uh, types of therapy and uh, different uh, specialists. So some specialize, for example, in working only with children. Uh, maybe they uh, would see a, a large number of kids who would suffer from attention uh, deficit or hyperactivity disorder, uh, some developmental disabilities. So you even autism now. Uh, so you can have a therapist who specializes in a certain age or even in a certain illness and they only deal with, let's say, depression. Um, but the majority of therapists would, would see anybody in all of these categories, from children to teenagers, college students, all the way up um, through individual therapy, grief therapy, whatever it may be. All right, what I wanna do is, um, See if I can get a video clip to show in just a minute of a typical therapy session. So you can look at the other screens. I'll see if I can get the middle one to play.
Okay, one more time. This is David's second meeting with Dr. Jim Nyman, a reach out volunteer psychiatrist who tries to treat schizophrenia with a combination of supportive talking therapy and medication. He believes both are necessary. Okay, we'll wait and see if I can get that in a minute. Ultimately, um, there are different views and a different relationship um, when we start talking about um, uh, the history between uh, how do Christians uh, view professional therapy and um, are there different approaches uh, that they take um, that we can outline here some of the different ways in which um, there's more positive uh, and more negative views, and I'll just put some up here. Um, there are, probably has been historically a change over the last number of years um, that have kind of contributed to a more positive view. And anybody come from a church background in which uh, psychological therapies is kind of suspect or there wouldn't be. Anybody have a church background or a history like that where there's really not a, um, a positive view towards professional psychological therapy? Okay. Very different today, by the way, than 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, you would find much more um, of those on the negative side um, uh, that there was some suspect between the disciplines, that is, a Christian approach uh, to how we deal with problems and the belief that psychology was encroaching upon or was even almost anti-Christian. And so it's been um, a very marked change over the last 20 years. Most of the churches now uh, out there uh, have psychologists that they use um, that when somebody comes and deals with a struggle or an issue that that's beyond their abilities. They almost have a great referral list. And that, that's been a big change over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and so you don't find as many on the negative side as in the past. Are there any questions that you have about this though, or uh, questions about this area and how we've used to view therapy? Because there's probably, again, some remnants of this. We used to, Biola, by the way, used to get picketed. Uh, 20 years ago when I was here, there was a guy who used to come around and say that Biola and, and individuals here were not in the will of God because they had a department of psychology. <laughs> and uh, that they should avoid coming to school here uh, simply because it's, um, it, it was one in which uh, we were using something called non-biblical therapy. You're not using the Bible and then therefore uh, it's not appropriate and that's been a around for a little while now. Um, okay, let's see, I think I got this to play, maybe. You guys remember David? Okay, it's not going to come on, but um, the the idea of any type of uh, session that an individual is in um, it was illustrated in this little clip where. Um, the goal was to try and get somebody, whether they were on the streets, somebody that was dealing with um, a, a, any of the disorders, um, to, to be able to begin to function uh, more optimally. That's the goal. Get them to function, enhance some of their personal growth and development, and then be able to get them to a point where there's at least satisfaction with, with their life and their life circumstances. That's the objective of most therapies, okay? 
sat, get them to sat, increase their satisfaction with their lot in life, their personal uh, circumstances, uh, help them to develop and to grow, uh, personal enhancement, and then that they're functioning, who they are and what they are like uh, is optimized. Now, the textbook gives a great definition um, uh, in general of what the goal uh, of most uh, or objectives of therapy it would be, and this goal would be to offer hope for the demoralized, giving people a new perspective in an empathic, trusting, and caring relationship. Okay. So, for a lot of therapists who ultimately decide to go into this field, what they're struck with is people who are oftentimes demoralized, struggling and not functioning well, realizing that they don't like what's happening to them, they don't understand it, and it's hard, it hurts. And they are motivated to try and help, to bring hope, uh, to give them ways of coping, ways of dealing with things, new insights into their beings, into their thoughts. And then they do it in a way that provides kind of a trusting, caring relationship. Um, and success it can be found in many cases um, uh, where a person uh, is able to come out of uh, oftentimes um, sessions in which they're learning new ways of living, um, new strategies for coping and new insights. And so this is um, really the objective of the therapies. Um, for me, uh, I remember just simply working with schizophrenics, um, or at least the majority were schizophrenics. Um, and in this particular um, hospital that I was doing an internship in, they, um, it almost felt um, uh, like it was impossible to help. There were so many ways in which um, you would begin to see how strongly people's lives were impacted by this disorder, and uh, yet you knew that if some of them would just maintain some of the treatment and, and even some of the new drug treatments that were out, that they would get better. And the question is, a lot of them would, wouldn't want to take pills or they wouldn't want to participate in the therapy. We'd have to watch them take their medications because some would take it or you know and pretend that they took it. Um, the, they would believe that they weren't sick and the, the, we always knew that there were ways in which treatment helped but you can't force somebody. You couldn't force them to do this. By the way, as far as uh, improvement, we do find that um, there is an increase in what we call improvement at the moderate to excellent level for those that do get, get into therapy. Um, so there's evidence that it is effective. Um, the problem has been making sure people participate in, and are able to do uh, some of the treatments that are out there. So. As far as specific kinds of therapy, one of the big new ones out there is biomedical therapies. I've already showed you electroconvulsive therapy, which is one of the biomedical therapies that we'll talk about. Um, but this one has, has taken off as far as numbers. Uh, how many have heard of Prozac before? Why have you heard of Prozac? It's because it's advertised everywhere, right? Prozac is now um, one of these multi-billion dollar drugs uh, a a as an industry. It, this is a huge, huge industry. We call it psychopharmacotherapy uh, or drug therapy, which um, has its basis, of course, in treating some of the major disorders that we've been talking about by using uh, things like drugs. Huge. today. Um, if I sent every one of you away to a doctor's office this afternoon and you had a doctor's appointment with your uh, primary care uh, uh, physician, um, a good percentage of you could walk away with, uh, with drugs tonight uh, simply by going in and expressing that you are 
you know, not feeling well, you're sad, uh, if you expressed any form of depression, and if they identified that, you were being honest about it, but you just talked about your sadness, or you talked about the anxiety you were experiencing, um, by far the largest, the, the, uh, the largest percentage of you would come away with a new prescription today. It is a huge industry out there um, with different treatment levels, um, uh, and different w approaches, but primarily they involve the use of, of uh, uh, categories of drugs uh, that I'll give you in just a second. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, why are people so resilient for, to not take their like, is, Why is it human nature for people not to yeah. I don't know why people, um, how many of you all, let, let's just, he, he asked why is it likely that some either deny their illness or they want to go get help? Was that the question? Um, there are still times in which, how many of you all have ever felt like you've been sick or ill and you didn't want to go into a doctor to waste the time to just go in and, and it's like, I'll just get better or, or maybe I'm not that sick. I think a lot of people feel that way and then sometimes it's just, if I don't go in, maybe I'll just get better. I, there's could be a lot of different motivations. Uh, yeah, I, you know, there are different times I know where, um, like I told you, I got hit, remember, with the golf ball, and I did not want to go in uh, until, uh, you know, I finally had to. I told you about that. I think I did. Yeah. It was also one in which you just start to deny, um, or maybe you just feel like, no, it's not that bad, or if I admit it, I'll get, it'll be, you know, it won't turn out well. Whatever it is, there's a lot of different motivations, but... Yeah, there's another part about vulnerability that she mentioned I think is, is possible, true, is true. I'll, the way we get treated by other people if we admit this, and there's a little bit of pride that can be involved. And oh, you to Prozac, you were actually depressed. Yeah, uh, Prozac, uh, by the way, if you're not depressed, Prozac is one of those types of drugs, it falls into these, uh, this uh, antidepressant category. Uh, Zoloft, Paxil, lots of these drugs. If you're not, well, actually with Prozac, it's, it can be used e even beyond an antidepressant. Uh, Prozac is used even with s some forms of anti-anxiety and other things. So it probably wouldn't hurt. It, it would depend upon if you were just completely normal. My guess is you would just experience some of the side effects of it, which wouldn't be all that fun. Uh, but it, it probably wouldn't have a huge effect on you. But um, you know, in their tests, they're safe enough at certain dosages to give to people, even who might have been misdiagnosed. But my guess is you wouldn't feel all that different. Um, but it depends, I guess, on how much you took. All of these you've seen advertised simply because this, this is a huge industry. Um, as you know, only psychiatrists and medical doctors can prescribe these medications. Psychologists cannot. Um, and there are ways in which um, some, at least one state is attempting to change that, but the vast majority um, psychologists must refer out to either a primary care or a psychiatrist in order to get a prescription for, let's say, one of these types of categories. All right, questions on drugs. Lithium, by the way, for bipolar. Lithium does this. If, you're, if your disorder is, is bipolar, and I, we talked about these cycles of up to mania and down to depression, lithium pretty much just kind of calms the highs and brings up the lows. And lithium is a fairly um, not that uh, uncommon of a substance uh, that's out there and so it's but it's very effective for sufferers of bipolar disorder yeah Um, th yeah, there are, and by the way, there are so many different kinds listed up here uh, that I just, I didn't put them all down. These were just ones I thought maybe people would have heard about. They do, they, they target certain different parts, let's say, um, of even brain chemistry. And so for some people, Prozac may be all you need if you're depressed, but it may not help you as well. And so doctors usually kind of start with those that they think are, they've you know, had experience with that are most effective. But let's say, for example, Paxil or Zoloft might be more effective for, and might help somebody else because they, they work in a slightly different way. Most of these antidepressants are what we call SSRIs. I don't know if you remember, we were talking about neurotransmitters where 
this, where the ser selective serotonin reuptake, the vacuum cleaner, most of these block the vacuum cleaner so that the reuptake mechanism of serotonin so it continues to process and to go through the system. And most of these are that way, but they work in different parts or different ways or different effectiveness. And for some people, it's just, it's like taking the difference between taking Tylenol for some, and not to minimize these, but versus taking, let's say, ibuprofen. Uh, sometimes it just works differently for people. All right, questions so far? Big area. Um, the expenditure in millions is, is now in the billion range. This is even old, but spending that goes on and the cost of these drugs is huge. And that's been, by the way, the main criticism is that we are too easy to prescribe medication for these major disorders. That's the biggest criticism, that we have a very quick trigger and people can go in, like I mentioned, you can go in and walk away with um, a prescription is not a good sign for a lot of people. They worry about the fact that we're over-medicating our, our country uh, and that people are walking away with prescriptions that they're not being treated psychologically or they're not being engaged to get to the root of the issue that we're putting Band-Aids on this. Um, so that's been the major criticism for, of the biomedical therapies, especially the drug treatments, uh, is that it, they're over, being overused. In, in many cases, by the way, it could be very helpful. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanted to just mention before we leave the electroconvulsive therapy, um, the use has gone up. Here are the numbers. In th it was higher back here in the 70s, um, but we didn't keep as many records on these. Uh, certainly over time, the numbers went down and then they've exploded. Now there's probably hundreds of thousands of people who are getting electroconvulsive treatments today uh, for major depression when antidepressants don't work. It's a very effective treatment uh, in major depression and you can see here the number of patients per year uh, is now over 100,000 receiving ECT. Um, by the way, here is just how their depression ratings uh, for before ECT and after are fairly significant. People, you saw Mary, the big difference between Mary was that she was now down in this range. Of, how many remember seeing Mary after treatment, what she looked like, how positive she was, and it was like she almost smiled and laughed at herself, and it was clear that there was something that happened and let me just say this, um, the answer to why somebody that's depressed, when you give them a, put them into a convulsion like that, a seizure, it does something to the brain and no one yet knows what it does. <laughs> that is, Mary, you saw clearly this major depressive, um, uh, these characteristics and symptoms that she was showing, went and received this treatment, and it's still unclear what happened in her brain. No one knows why did being in a seizure, why did that cause her to no longer feel depressed? And no one knows why, there's no good yet answer for it for that that satisfies everybody that oh that's what a seizure does but you can see the difference in her behavior um, and there are some theories out there about what it's doing chemically to the brain but this is a, a, still a mystery yeah there's a musical about someone who gets ECT but she experiences amnesia like she forgets everything yeah yeah, uh, one of the side effects, um, and, and in fact it's one that most people are, are well aware of, is, is the idea of amnesia. That is, it, instead of amnesia, it just, it's just simply a, lo a lack of memory of right before and right after treatment. And many individuals like Mary have been asked, would you do this again when you're depressed? Would you want to get this treatment? And she says, even though I forget things, even though I don't remember this period of this, this maybe couple of days, I still want that to happen when I'm depressed, please do that. But, but yeah, there is one of the side effects is memory loss. Um, so it's not uncommon. It's not that great, but there is a period of time. Yeah, there's jokes about this all of the time. People that are, you know, they, they talk about um, 
ways in which you know this this helps them, uh, but they realize that they need to make this decision when they're doing well because when they're depressed they don't even want to go through this. Um, but they will talk about how they. Uh, they, they, you know, shock has brought you know this kind of shock treatment. It's like uh, you know getting fried. They call it, uh, or go, they're going to see the colonel. As some will say it's like you know, to, to like a KFC person to go get fried, and they're about to go get help. Wait one more time. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, Mary will not necessarily get, stay this way. She will probably need to do this uh, perhaps a couple of times uh, uh, it, it, in the matter of that year just to get the effective treatment. So it's not just a one time, for, for, for some it is, you can, you know, it could be effective, but for some it's, uh, it, you have to do this a couple of times. But it seems as if it still helps each time, but it's not just a one time thing. Is that what your question? Yeah, it has to be repeated. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, it's a good question uh, about tolerance that will uh, eventually stop working, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I don't think they do. I think they, use, they space them out enough that it does take them out of major depression, um, but I don't know if the effectiveness wanes over time. I haven't heard that it does, but, but um, yeah. By the way, the um, use of drug therapies are most effective when combined with psychological therapies. This is um, really the goal of what we call uh, psycho co psychopharmological therapy, or again, the combination of psychological and talking therapies with drug treatment, with drug therapies. By far, the most effective treatment is when they're combined, okay? When you combine drug therapies with psychological talking therapies, you almost always have greater uh, rates of remission and uh, of greater benefit to people who are struggling than if they only took drugs or if they only had the psychological therapies, okay? So in a combined way, these work best. Now, the psychological therapies have a variety of different ways you can do this. If any of you all have an interest in going into this field, um, the needs have not changed in the 20 some odd years I've been in this field. In fact, it feels like there's more people struggling with things, even now more so than ever. But you can do lots of different things if you decide to go into this field professionally. Um, after your college degree, you can go into counseling psychology, you can go into clinical psychology or psychiatry, but all of these would allow you that opportunity to work in this field um, at slightly different ways and different clients, but these are the, some different pathways. Just so you know, most people who go into using um, what we call psych psychotherapy are what we call eclectic. They, they follow a variety of different types of theories. And so some that you might find out there might um, use a particular type of therapy. Let's say it's um, a cognitive behavioral approach or psychoanalysis, um, maybe a psychodynamic approach. But the vast majority of therapists use different techniques from or different sources or different methods from these um, very different theoretical schools. And we call that eclectic. So that most psychotherapists are not just coming out of one type of method or one type of theoretical school. They use a variety of different sources um, in a, their approach because sometimes if you deal with somebody with a phobic disorder it's going to be very different and you have to use different methods um, and different practices than if somebody was dealing with depression or OCD. So in this regard you could see here um, eclectic would be the vast majority others like client-centered or cognitive or psychodynamic. Um, and of course there are different alternatives. Counseling, even biblical counseling and support groups um, would all be different ways that people could also get um, help besides going, let's say, in the psychotherapy route. Okay, questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Can I ask a question about how specific drugs work? Yeah. Um, 
all of the drugs have a, um, d you know, the, the drugs that we were talking about, depending upon which kind they use, dip they approach and affect different serotonin, for example, the mood disorders. Uh, would primarily be serotonin. A lot of the schizophrenic or antipsychotics would affect most of your dopamine um, uh, neurotransmitters. And then anti-anxiety would kind of be a combination of things, probably things like, if you remember, our inhibitories, like inhibitors like GABA. That would be an example, um, yeah. There are different kinds of therapies that are out there that um, you would find um, more controversy over. Um, usually if they're used in the right way um, with the right person or let's say the right treatment, then it's not a problem. But there are sometimes in which if somebody constantly uses the same approach for anybody that comes in, then, then it may not be as effective. And so disagreement would be that some would criticize somebody from using a single method or a single approach from a single theoretical school to, uh, to deal with all kinds of different areas. And that's when people would say, I'm not sure that's the best approach. But that, that's, that's, that's about as far as a lot of people would go with this. OK, guess what? We're going to end early. Here's the thing. All I want you to do is look at your major approaches, psychoanalysis, person-centered, behavioral and cognitive. And we're going to end early today. So what you'll have to do is make sure that you read this section on, um, uh, of course, all three chapters. Let me just tell you this. Read all of the textbook. It's very important, personality, disorders, and therapy. Read it, know all about it, use the study guide to help you follow along, and use my notes to also show what's important on this test. It'll be the same as the other ones, 50 questions, multiple choice, and true, false. All right? All right, we'll see you Wednesday. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.